All right, so thank you everyone for coming um, tonight to talk about uh, police abolition. I have a quote here from the great scholar, Ruth Wilson Gilmore, um, which gives you a sense of the scope of what we're talking about, which is not small. She says, abolition is a movement to end systematic violence, including the interpersonal vulnerabilities and displacements that keep the system go going. The goal is to change how we interact with each other and the planet by putting people over profit, welfare over warfare, and life over death. So um, as we talk about police abolition, a couple of things to remember. One is, is that typically speaking, um, most people who are abolitionists um, are, uh, abol would, uh, are abolitionists in relation to both police and prisons. And even um, you will often hear people just say prison abolitionists. Oftentimes they mean the entire system from policing through prisons and beyond. So it's kind of a shorthand for a term that some people use called the prison industrial complex, which is quote, the linked relations of surveillance, policing and imprisonment. Um, we're gonna focus tonight on policing for obvious reasons, but we will talk a little bit about prisons. It's important to understand that for most abolitionists, these all kind of all go together. Um, abolition can seem off the wall Abolitionists can seem like unrealistic utopian dreamers, um, and it can feel like a meaningless abstract slogan. Um, I would say that in reality, when the Democratic Socialists of America, or DSA, took a position in favor of abolition in 2017, it was joining a long-standing tradition of organizing intellectual work. And so part of why we're here is to try and understand that um, and place what we're doing in that context, and also to share some uh, ways of understanding this um, with others as well. So we're glad you're here to be a part of it, and uh, let's get started. So these are our goals for today. Um, one, we're gonna talk a little bit about why police and prisons are taken for granted. That's why it can be difficult for us to take a critical stance towards them. We're gonna talk a little bit about the origins of police and a little less about the origins of prisons, but we'll talk about that as well. We'll try and distinguish a little bit about various non-abolitionist approaches so we can understand where abolition falls in relation to these other things. And we'll try and flesh out what abolition means. Um, and then we'll discuss a little bit about what can be done from an abolitionist point of view. Um, and we will have time for questions at the end. So um, as we're doing this, I should understand that I'm a socialist and I'm also an abolitionist. Um, it would be wonderful if to convince you all to be abolitionists, but that's not really my goal. My goal here is really to help you understand what this all means. Um, it's important both uh, to understand even if that's not a position you would take. It's an important to understand if it is a position you take to really kind of have a, gra a grounding of what it all means. Um, so uh, yeah. And then the one other thing I'll say is that oftentimes people have some questions that they kind of want to handle up front, some obvious kind of like things that don't make sense to them. Um, and I will gonna get to some of those things, but I, they're gonna come at the end because I think if we begin them, if we start at the beginning with them, it's easy to kind of lose the, the whole picture. So I promise we'll get to that. We'll have time for your questions. You wanna press me and everything, um, but just know that that sort of thing is coming. So I mentioned this there that we have a tendency to take um, prisons and police for granted our cops in prisons. So um, why is that? Um, Angela D Davis is somebody that really makes this point. Um, and it's important for us to be able to take a critical stance back. We want to think about them um, clearly. Um, if you think about this, like when did you first learn about police? Um, for a lot of us, uh, we learn about police in like children's books and cartoons and things like that. Um, you, you know, might even be at the pre-verbal stage before you can even make sense of anything. Um, and in this sort of thing, what are cops? As is demonstrated here in this children's book, um, cops are, are kind of all purpose helpers um, and they are authorities. Um, there are lots of representations of um, police, um, less so of prisons and children's books. Um, here's another. Do you think about this it's when, you're, when you're a kid in children's books? I mean, this is getting a little bit better, but not as much as it should. There are only a handful of jobs. Cop is one of the jobs, uh, you know, farmer, fireman, spaceman, there's like four or five jobs for boys. And then nurse or teacher, the way this is presented is, as uh, 
you know, very gendered, a handful of things. And, you know, here we have depiction of cops as the leader, um, kind of standard way in which these things are presented. So adult media also has a tendency to take police and prisons for granted. So here we have some depictions of that. I updated this from my older slides. Um, there is an endless supply of shows about police on uh, regular TV. Um, most of these shows often are uh, you know, on um, marathon. You can just watch them for hours on end. You can find them on multiple channels. Um, plenty of shows um, depict cops and in, even if they're not particularly about them, it's kind of a dominant thing, a dominant trope um, in our entertainment media. Um, and if you think about the way that these presentations work, um, they have, um, as I said, they're ubiquitous, these sort of things. Um, they're heavily from the perspective of the authorities. So whether we're talking about movie, TV, or even um, the news. So what are some of the lessons that are implicit in these sort of shows? Um, one is the equation of violence and crime and people who commit crime. That's kind of treated as all one thing. Um, another is the dehumanization and demonization of criminals and criminalized populations. Another is the necessity of violence and lawlessness in order to contain disorder, which is obviously a paradox. Another is that the depiction is of the process is that it's relatively quick and efficient um, and that rights and lawyers muck that up. So in what you, these shows, usually someone gets arrested, they're brought to trial and it's all over in like half an hour, an hour. Um, which is not a good depiction of how it really works. And it's also heavily racialized. So these are some of the messages that we're getting if you're watching any of these shows that are on constantly. And as I said, it's not just those TV shows. If you think about something like MSNBC on the weekends runs endless uh, you know, kind of documentary type things of lockup, um, you know, kind of lurid depictions of prisons. Um, the news tends to present a, um, in normal conditions um, police perspectives is, is taken for granted. So police statements are just treated as fact um, under normal circumstances, which is a little different than what we're in right now. But it's even bigger than media representations. So this is a quote here we have from Angela Davis. The ideological work that prison performs, it relieves us of the responsibility of seriously engaging with the problems of our society, especially those produced by racism and increasingly global capitalism. And obviously the police are the ones that are putting those people in the prison. So this is all connected. So one of the things that's worth noting about these things is that even though police and prisons are ubiquitous in our world, taken for granted, um, they are not things that have always existed. Um, they have a history. Um, this is a picture here of Robert Peel. He was the founder of the London Metropolitan Police in 1829, which is often thought of as the kind of beginnings of policing. Um, he drew from the military, so they had uniforms and hierarchy and all those sorts of things that we associate with police today, but originated in the military. Um, he got his experience before creating the police, uh, the first uh, police department by policing the um, Ireland, which at the time was a, a colonial possession of the UK. So took the lessons of trying to control a colonized population into the urban center for the working class in London. Um, Boston is typically noted as having the first police department in the US and it was created in 1838. Um, the lines between those things and things that were before are not always clear. So there's some dispute as to when exactly that happens. Um, but nonetheless, um, this is happening around the time of really um, the um, increase in markets is kind of pulling more and more people into um, not working for themselves, but being in the working class in the United States. Couple things to think about is how does policing differ from prior modes of law enforcement? Well, one thing is, is that policing entails a shift from being um, reactive to being proactive. Um, the target of this sort of thing was urban, predominantly immigrant working class people. But if you think about who else would have been subject to this sort of proactive policing at the time, would have been enslaved people with slave patrols um, in the South. Um, it would have been colonized people. Um, 
So these things are all connected. Slave patrols are an important precursor to policing. Um, so is um, Indian patrols in the United States and also um, kind of privatized violence of vigilantism. To some extent, what happened was bringing people that were um, doing you know, uh, policing and violence kind of on a private matter and bringing them into the official realm of the state. Briefly, this is a picture of the first uh, prison in the United States, or the first prison actually. Um, this is the Wall Street Penitentiary. Before that, it was the Wall Street Jail. Um, it becomes this first prison in 1795. Um, you have uh, the Western and Eastern State Penitentiaries soon follow, and then Auburn and New York. These are kind of all the pla key places where prisons were kind of invented. Um, it was an American intervention, although it obviously grew out of existing things. How does a prison differ from prior forms of confinement? Jails are for were at the time mostly for waiting for corporal punishment um, or the death penalty. Um, the point, um, one of the shifts that comes with prisons is the idea that they are um, reforming, um, that reform and, and reform and prisons begin together. Um, it was a reform idea. And the idea was that you could change, um, you could change prisoners and to make them proper citizens um, by imprisoning them, by caging them, and by controlling them. Um, one of the things that some of these early prisons did is that they um, ensured that uh, basically solitary confinement, the idea was that people would be penitent. Um, the problem was is that essentially drove people insane. It did not work. Um, but reform is part of the history of these things all from the very beginning. They were always about um, improving and making changes. Um, reform is not something that comes much later. Prisons and policing were from the beginning designed to deal with some of the vast inequalities that are produced under capitalism, right? They're not the only means of social control, but they were very, very important ones. Um, and historically, periods of market um, domination, relative market domination, have always been um, periods of greater punitiveness, right? Speaking of which, so let's talk about the, the problem here. So um, I'm using um, prisons here, prison population, because it's a much easier thing to count than some of the other things we might get at, but this gives you some sense of the massive increase in punitiveness um, and in resources that were devoted to um, imprisoning people and policing and all these sorts of things. This is a depiction of the US state and federal prison population from 1925 to 2014. Um, it would not look super different if we were to add a few more years, even though it has gone down a little bit. And what you can see is, is that the, the numbers are pretty static. They bounce around a little bit. Um, but around the 1970s, they absolutely explode. Um, in a moment, in around the 1970s, people were, as we'll get to, taking seriously the idea, even in relatively non-radical circles, that maybe prisons were a bad idea, maybe they were on the way out. Um, this was a serious thing that was contended in kind of mainstream society. Instead, what happens is this massive explosion of punitiveness um, on levels that were just unthinkable before that. Um, and needless to say that this, there were lots of other things. So the um, prison population is one, only one element of this detention. You have many people in jail, many people on probation, lots of people caught up in this system that essentially the prisons are a relatively small slice. Um, there's also other types of detention. So there's immigrant, um, immigration detention, youth detention, like uh, Guantanamo Bay, things like that. Um, the same period saw a big expansion of policing as well. Um, needless to say, you needed lots of policing and aggressive policing in order to have all these people in prison. It also was, to some extent, a reduction in the rights uh, that people had in criminal justice. Um, you know, kind of general belief of judges, prosecutors, and politicians that uh, they needed to get tough on people, to get lots of people into prison, and that the idea was that it would deter crime. Um, you might think that that might bring it down, but it did not. Um, one of the things that goes on here is the perceptions of safety, um, at least in the United States, are relatively unconnected from official crime rates. And official crime rates are relatively unconnected to these like levels of punitiveness. So there was a bit of a kind of um, uh, increase in crime. I'm gonna compliment, com or try and complicate that later. 
But for the moment, we can say there was an increase in crime around this time when this big boom kicks off. Um, it was partly due to the fact that there was a larger cohort of younger people because younger men tend to be the ones that are doing a lot of this. They age out of it fairly early on. Um, but the, those official numbers came back down before this boom really got off, right? So um, this is really unconnected um, in terms of policy from what was going on on the ground. Um, the other thing that's worth noting is that, um, per, as I say, perceptions of safety and are largely unconnected to crime rates. And what that means, for example, is that over time, there's little connection. There's little connection geographically. So people who live in um, places with some of the lowest crime tend to be the ones that ex, um, express the highest fears. And the people that are the least likely to experience, say, violent crime are often the, among the ones that are most concerned about crime. Um, so the that suggests that a lot of what's going on is not simply people reacting to the way the world is, although there are real public safety concerns, um, but to other things, including some of the media representations I talked about before. So when we talk about prisons, we often talk in abstractions. And when we talk about policing, we're often talking in very personalized terms of some of the um, more dramatic cases we've seen. So these four individuals are four people who were killed very recently within the last couple months, um, who you may recognize. Um, organizing around policing is often very connected to showing the images of these people, of um, saying their name, um, reminding us of who they were and their value as human beings and the ways that they were not treated that way by the police. Um, so from the top left, we have George Floyd, who is the one that has garnered the most attention. Um, he was killed for allegedly trying to pay with a counterfeit bill um, by a police officer um, who cut off his breathing with the, his knee, and that was in Minneapolis. Um, Brianna Taylor was killed when police returned fire on her boyfriend after they invaded the wrong house with a no-knock warrant related to drug dealing. He shot her eight times, killing her. Tony McDade is a transgender man who was suspected of a fatal shooting was shot and killed with police statements about the incident that were contradicted by witnesses. It's more unclear what happened in that case. Um, and then Ahmed Aubrey was killed by a retired cop and his son while, they, while he was jogging. They claimed that he, quote, fit the description of someone who was suspected of a string of break-ins. So fit the description um, often means, you know, young black man or something like that, and you're often very vague. Um, in police speak. Um, but the other thing is, is there was no evidence of this string of break-ins. And in this case, they were just two citizens, a retired cop and his son. Um, it's important as we think about this, that we're talking about policing, that oftentimes, um, in particular, white um, civilians take themselves to be, um, kind of take that role as well. And they're often welcomed in that by the police, especially when they have these sort of relationships like this retired police officer. Um, I have done this presentation in the past and I could have done an entirely set of different people in different moments. Um, but these are the, the folks that we're focusing on today um, as everything is going on. So while I was showing you those pictures and those names of people who have been very recently killed, this is a problem that's existed for a very long time. Um, there's reason to think the police shootings have mostly gone down over time, even dramatically on the sort of scale that we were talking about looking back on the um, prison chart. Um, as, I mean, I think part of the reason for that is because there has been pushback and part of the reason for that is over time, increasingly more of this was happening through, uh, more of the social control was happening um, by people that were arrested and put in prison and less through that sort of um, extrajudicial violence, excuse me, on the street. Um, but as we think about it, at the end of slavery um, in uh, 1863, uh, there was private or quasi-public violence was the main means of social control of Black people, especially in the South. This con the construction of Black people as criminals, as dangerous, and as violent was one of the key means by which white supremacy was legitimated at the end of slavery. Um, if you're interested in this, I would recommend a book by Khalil Gibran uh, Muhammad's the, the Condemnation of Blackness, and he details this in, uh, very well. So you had at this time all white police forces, all white judicial systems, all white juries that would have ensured that no one who was white 
who engage in this sort of violence would be held accountable right, for those actions. Um, this was also reinforced by a white economic power structure. So black people who resisted or who were just seen as getting too independent um, could lose their job, they could be evicted, they could be refused loans, et cetera. Um, so that was the, so these two things kind of work together. Um, lynchings would have been, uh, which is what we would have called this private violence, um, were often very public affairs. They were sometimes publicized even beforehand, even in the newspaper. Um, where um, large crowds of people might gather to witness, um, bring their families, which is exceedingly gruesome. Um, as a result of these changes after slavery, um, this effort to reinstitute social control over black people, um, poor whites often found themselves largely, but not entirely, disenfranchised by all these tools. So for example, the same tools that were used to surreptitiously exclude black people from voting and from juries ended up often excluding many poor white people as well. Um, the divisions between the races seriously would have hampered the, race, the labor movement at the time in the South in particular, um, which ensured bad conditions and bad pay for all workers, but obviously not equally. Um, and some of the initial moves towards civil rights in the South would have included basically quick show trials followed by immediate executions where people would have said, um, Southerners might have said, well, you know, what do you want? We gave them a trial. Yes, it only took 20 minutes, but we did it, um, as opposed to in the past where it would have just been privatized violence. During the civil rights movement, policing was central at multiple levels. One is that the failure to protect black people, the violence and harassment of police were among the most important grievances of the movement. Um, particularly bad police departments or um, police heads were often targeted for protest because people understood um, that they were going to um, react violently um, and that this would demonstrate the violence of the system to um, particularly to Northern liberals. Um, also, pr police brutality, um, sorry, Policing was also used to attack and disrupt protests, which is what we're showing here, particularly on the top left, um, which is a, a picture of a early Southern civil rights protest, right? This would have included assault, mass arrests, targeting of leaders, et cetera, right? Police brutality, especially killings, was a major grievance underlying the urban riots um, in the later 60s, which is depicted on the bottom right here. Um, and instances of police brutality were among the most important thing that set off those urban rebellions in the 1960s. Um, meaning that there was a large number of grievances that people had in, um, this was often in Northern cities. Um, so substandard housing, substandard schools, no jobs, the whole, whole gamut of things. But often it was the um, instances of police brutality or police killing. Um, that would set these sort of off. And the policing response, and also from the National Guard, which also got involved, was um, tended to be particularly brutal, um, and the impact on cities was also pretty significant. Government used both violence and concessions to try and, and quell that unrest, um, which was at a time where it was um, the things I'm describing were one, only one of the many things that were going on. There was a whole lot of radicalism, a whole lot of unrest, um, for example, including um, against the war in Vietnam. Okay, black people were not the only targets of police. The left and the labor movement, at least when it has been relatively militant, have also been targets um, of both violence and imprisonment, um, which is, of course, also violence. Um, pictured here, though, are Fred Hampton, who a, was a leader of the Black Panther Party. The Black Panther Party was started um, in part um, to resist police brutality, but it ended up having a much broader vision. But one of its most early things it did was to patrol the streets in Oakland to try and disrupt um, police harassment and brutality um, while armed, which of course made the police very nervous and they were soon uh, pa in California passed them gun control as a result. Hampton was assassinated in his sleep by the Chicago PD. Um, who busted into his apartment and shot it up um, in a particularly gruesome fashion. Angela Davis, on the bottom right here, was imprisoned for her alleged involvement in an attempt to free another movement leader, George Jackson. Um, she, um, she is still alive today, thankfully, but she was imprisoned at the time. Um, the sort of experience that led people like Davis and Jackson um, uh, to articulate abolitionist politics 
was the experience I've just been describing and the fact that they had experienced being in jail and prison themselves. Um, in addition, abolition was heavily influenced by the radicalization of people from the inside of prisons who did not start out as radicals, um, but they were radicalized by seeing the movement outside and also um, by the interchange with the radicals who were included as many, many were imprisoned. Um, this tradition continues today. So at the same time, both major parties moved to the right um, when it came to questions of crime. Um, they uh, worked to expand policing, uh, worked to reduce the rights of civilians, um, those, and also those accused or convicted of crime. They expanded prisons, in particular in California, which really led the way. Um, increased sentences and all sorts of things like that. Right? The same period saw a rather significant cuts in social services and labor rights and in taxes on the wealthy and corporations. So at the same time they were taking in less money, they were spending it increasingly less on meeting human needs and more and more on caging people and policing. Um, there have been a number of times in our history, um, even relatively recent history, where issues of policing and prisons have been forced onto the agenda. And one of the big things that have done that is particularly high profile cases of police brutality or police murdering people. Um, in particular, those that have been caught um, on video so that people could witness what was happening. So we have the assault of Rodney King by the LAPD in 1991 that set off the LA rebellion, the killing of Trayvon Martin in 2012 by a man who was engaging in informal private policing, not himself a police officer, um, although kind of treated as a, as a supporter by them. Um, there was the killing of Michael Brown by police in 2014, which set off the protests in Ferguson and beyond, inspiring the Black Lives Matter movement. And then we obviously have our current moment where in particular it was George Floyd's um, incident that has caught the most attention, but it was a, at the end of a string of incidences, including a few I didn't even mention. Um, over time, I would argue that abolitionist perspectives have gained prominence throughout these movements. In part, I think, because as each wave of new activists have kind of come into the issue of policing and prisons, they've learned the same lesson, which is that non-abolitionist reform efforts have largely been a failure. So we can talk a little bit about some of what those non-abolitionist understandings of the problem look like and what they are, and we can try and distinguish them. Um, I'm not gonna give a comprehensive overview of them or um, anything like that, but I just wanna kind of highlight um, some of the key notions and how they relate. And I would call these sort of things um, reformist reforms. They are designed to fix the system, not to replace it, to shore it up, generally speaking. So first off, we have mass incarceration. This is the name given to the huge expansion of the prison population in the United States in the neoliberal era, kind of beginning, the beginning of the 1970s, um, and the connected policing changes that came with it. But it often focuses particularly on the prison population. Um, the new Jim Crow is the term from Michelle Alexander's book by the same name, and her idea is that the, um, the new Jim Crow of the expansion of mass incarceration was kind of a third form of social control for Black people in the United States following slavery and also Jim Crow. The privatization is, um, refers to the rise of um, private prisons and private jails, so those that are typically done for profit rather than um, by the state. Um, and then professionalism is the idea that the problem is a basic lack of training or education or processes for police themselves. And then lastly, I have here failure slash mistakes. And this is the notion essentially that when there's a problem, when we look at these sort of problems, whether it be this mass expansion of um, the prison population or police killings or whatnot, um, that these are, um, failures or mistakes of the system, that the system is fundamentally something else and it is somehow um, just kind of losing its, um, its way or um, falling out of, out, of, uh, out of itself in some bit. Um, so a couple things to think about um, and how this relates to abolitionists. Um, it is absolutely true that we have seen this um, massive growth of mass incarceration um, and it's important for us to think about. But at the same time, abolitionists would argue that there was a problem before that. Um, and that even if we were to, oftentimes the argument is we need to reduce mass incarceration 
um, which is a pretty, that seems to accept that we're even going to continue to have mass incarceration. We'll just have a little less of it. Even if you say end mass incarceration, it still suggests that we're going to have lots of incarceration. The United States is one of the most carceral countries in the world. Um, so it's, this is relatively surface level. Um, the new Jim Crow really focuses on racism, which is exceedingly important, um, in particular on racial disparities. The fact that um, um, black people in particular are so much more likely in relation to white people to get longer sentences, to be charged and things like that, um, to experience over policing. Um, but there's surely more to it than that. Um, this is about um, white supremacy. It's about capitalism. It's also about changes in capitalism. Um, there's larger political economic shifts that happen around the same time, like the abandonment of full employment as a goal, the flight of capital waste from cities and things like that. Um, we talk about privatization. It's surely, I think, gross to think that there are people who have a profit interest in having more and more people caged. Um, oftentimes, not only do they have it directly, but this gets written into contracts where they kind of, um, the government will um, guarantee that there'll be so many beds filled as humans in their, in their cages, um, which is pretty troubling. Um, but the vast majority of people in the United States who are imprisoned or in jail are in public um, institutions. So privatization has kind of risen to fill in some of the gaps as this expansion happened so quickly, um, it is not really the driver. Um, I should also say that there's lots of um, profit making that happens even in public prisons. Um, but fundamentally, I would argue that's not what's driving this. Um, when it comes to professionalism, um, the, the idea here is that this is something that's been trotted out for years. If you think about some of those other moments I mentioned um, where um, there were big reform efforts as a result of particularly dramatic uh, moments and the um, up unrest that happened as a result of them. I um, mean, professionalism and training is something that's always, always trotted out. So you get this uh, notion that maybe we need to increase police pay, even though they're particularly well paid in relation to other um, people and particularly other public employees. You get the notion that um, they need implicit bias training, that they need to learn to do things like not put their knee on someone's neck. Um, I would argue that um, there's very little evidence that this sort of, these sort of efforts have made any difference historically um, and for reasons we'll talk about later. And part of that, it gets to this last point, this idea of the failure of mistake. Um, abolitionists would argue, and I would agree, um, that there's no mistake and there's no failure, that the system is doing what it's designed to do. Um, and as a result, that's why abolitionists would say the problem is not trying to fix these institutions, it is to uh, get rid of them. So I have a depiction here of um, part of what I'm getting at when I say that abolitionists kind of see these problems as inherent. Um, so what am I trying to um, show here? This notion of crime, which I want to um, problematize for you, is something I want us to think about. The, the stereotypical way we think about crime, that crime is depicted in the United States, in all those media um, and in our politics that I mentioned before, is that you have essentially um, three sets of people, right? You have criminals, stereotypically black men, right? were the ones who are constructed as violent um, and lawless and things like that. You have victims, um, often prototypically white women, um, historically. Um, then you have the authorities. So this is the police and prison guards, right? Um, those people do not, almost by definition, commit the crime. They only do violence to criminals, even though that can be illegal. Uh, the abolitionist Dean Spade reminds us that the prison is a serial killer and a rapist, but that is left out of our ways of thinking about these things. So we know that cops engage in harassment, they engage in violence, not just in the kind of spectacular uh, moments like what we're experiencing at the moment, but all the time. It's one of the things that I think people miss as to why particular instances of police brutality can be a spark is because there's so much um, tremendous underlying grievances broader economic ones and things like that, but also about kind of routine police harassment um, that many people face. Um, so the instances of violence are kind of just um, on top of all that, which is why they can act as that spark. Um, people who don't fit the profile of perpetrators um, 
are often um, left out of this. So if you think about someone like Brock Turner, he was the college student who um, brutally raped another college student um, who got a, a very small sentence because the um, judge said essentially that he was a good person, um, a good young man. Um, or there's Jerry Sandusky, someone that got away with terrible things for a long time, in part because someone like him, a respected football coach, white man, is not the picture we have of who a criminal is. Um, criminals being demonized justifies violence and degradation against them or the populations that are so criminalized. Um, and those who don't conform to societal norms are less likely to be taken serious as victims and themselves um, tend to be criminalized. Yeah, sorry about that. Again, abolitionists see these problems as inherent. And this is a quote from abolitionist scholar Beth Ritchie, um, who helps us make sense of some of these things I was just mentioning. She says, the more stigmatized their, their social position, the easier it is to victimize them. The further a woman's sexuality, age, class, criminal background, and race are from hegemonic norms, the more likely it is they'll be harmed, and then the more likely that their harm will be, not be taken seriously. So it makes it easier for them to be victims, but it also makes it um, less likely that the, the criminal punishment system takes them seriously and does anything about it. We could have added here mental illness, disability, and more. There are many um, groups who experience this sort of disparity as well. Um, um, or you also um, trans people who experience such violence and degradation from the system at very high rates. Okay, so what does abolition mean? I've been talking for a while, so we're gonna get to that. This is a quote from uh, the organizer, Marion Kaba, um, who you might know uh, from Twitter. Um, she says, I'm actively working towards abolition which means that I'm trying to create the conditions necessary to ensure the possibility of a world without prisons. So recall here, where without prisons is broader than that, it's the prison industrial complex that includes policing, All right? Um, so the idea that many people get confused by is they think that what abolitionists are saying is that we're tomorrow, we'll just have no police and no prisons, we'll open the, system, open the gates, everyone lets out, the world will be exactly as it was, just without these two institutions. Um, that makes no sense to people, understandably. And they often think that what would mean, that would actually mean is we would end up just recreating these things um, with different names. Um, and we probably would if that's what we were talking about. But as um, Kaba is explaining here, um, what we're talking about is changing the world to make this a possibility. Um, and needless to say, this opens up a lot of space of the sort of things we're going to talk about. They are not um, the normal way in our society that we talk about issues of crime is that it's separate from the economy or it's separate from problems around um, sexual violence or what have you. Each of these things is kind of an independent thing. Um, and abolition explodes that, right? It asks us to take all these things as part of our world and understand how they're interconnected. So the idea is what we're talking about is something much bigger than simply getting rid of these two institutions, okay? Still, we need some more clarity, so we'll continue. Um, what does abolition mean? Number one, I would say that it's an organizing demand. That is, in the act of making it, it requires us to think of the changes that would be required in the world to attain it. It's meant to change our sense of what is possible to force us to rethink what we take for granted, right? Um, it's not impossible. We could think about areas and people who are not subject to police and prisons. Kaba mentioned something that you should think about, which is if you go into a wealthy white neighborhood, you can get a little glimpse of what abolition might look like because the people in those neighborhoods are not subject for the most part to policing. If you're from another neighborhood and you um, look at it and you go there, you might be, but they themselves are not, right? And they tend to be people who are safer um, that have greater public safety which suggests that the, the people who are most policed often have the least, right? So the demand is meant to help bring into being the political conditions it requires in order to happen, okay? Um, 
The labor journalist Sarah Jaffe has a quote. Um, she says, your demand has to be big enough to fight for. I think a lot of times we have this notion that you have to make demands small so you don't scare people off. And what Sarah here is saying is that in fact, if you want change, if you want big change, you need people to fight and they're not gonna do it for a small thing. The whole point of, of having a bigger demand is precisely to produce that political um, force to make it possible, right? I should also note that generally speaking, abolitionists include ending capitalism as part of the changes that are required for this. Um, there, there is a notion among some socialists that um, abolitionists are confused because they don't realize that who require the end of capitalism. Um, I have yet to meet such an abolitionist. Um, overwhelmingly tend to be anti-capitalist as well as abolitionist. Um, but fundamentally, just like anti-capitalism, um, um, abolition can challenges us to our core in terms of things that we take for granted, um, but it also in practice requires it to be something we can grasp in specific contexts. So here's a Angela Davis illustrating this here. Her quote, an attempt to create a new conceptual terrain for imagining alternatives to imprisonment involves the ideological work of questioning why criminals have been constituted as a class and indeed as a class of human beings undeserving of the civil and human rights accorded to others. What else does abolition mean? It also requires us to distinguish between the concept of harm and the concept of crime. Um, and so I pose a question that you cannot tell back to me, but I would ask you to think about it. Um, I would argue that you can get to zero crime, absolute zero crime, not a single crime. And it would be very easy, like policy wise, right? How would you do that? How would you make it so it'd be like zero crime? The way you would do it is you would make everything legal. If you do that, we have no crime. People who say they wanna get rid of crime do not want that. Why? Because that's not anyone's actual goal. It's a thing we say, but if we think about it, it doesn't make any sense. For most of us, our actual goal is addressing harm. When we think about crime, we think about particularly harmful things um, that we have concerns about. Many of us recognize that there's lots of things that are criminalized that aren't, actually aren't that harmful. Um, yet, oftentimes, um, policing in particular seems to focus a lot of attention on those sorts of things. Um, and it can be hard for us to make sense of all this if we're not capable of pulling apart these notions. So not all crimes are harmful, right? Um, many harmful things are not crimes. There are things, not all law enforcement is dealt with by po um, police and prisons. So you might think of things like wage theft, which is particularly a huge problem, or workplace health and safety, particularly a huge problem, especially now, or housing regulations. These are all things where you can have things that are illegal, um, that are a law enforcement problem, but they're generally not dealt with by policing and prisons. And as increasingly we've focused more and more on crime from a policy perspective, there has been a tendency to divert resources away from meeting human needs, i.e. addressing harm and towards fighting crime, um, regardless of whether it uh, creates harm. And sometimes even regardless if the person is actually doing anything illegal, that's what happens when you criminalize populations. Um, by virtue of who you are, you're seen as a criminal, um, which is a problem. I would argue that our goal should be addressing harm, right? Reducing, um, reducing harm wherever we can, um, um, addressing it where it happens. Um, and if we do that, we may rethink a lot of these sorts of things. Um, the goal is not crime reduction. Okay, what else? I mentioned this already. Abolition means a belief that the system is working as intended, right? What does that mean? It means that the rich are mostly untouched. Um, there are even theorists of uh, the criminal punishment system which say that that's good, that we should have cost imposition, that's civil law um, for rich people. So we'll, you know, they can pay fines and things like that and have lawsuits. Um, whereas other people, poor people, black people, Latino people, Native Americans, that those people should be targeted um, for criminal law. Um, but the reality is, is regardless of whether you admit that or not, that's actually the system we have. Those populations I just mentioned 
are often targeted, again, regardless of the actions of any particular individual. Um, it's also worth noting that cops generally find criticisms of them murdering unarmed civilians as an attack on them. I think we should believe them. They understand what the job is and they think that that's part of the job. Um, so if you, don't, if you think it shouldn't be, that's one thing. Um, but I think we should um, understand that that is often how the police and the institutions that support them see their job, which is why they take such criticisms um, so poorly. Another element of abolition is addressing root causes, right? So think of it, people steal because they're poor. They may often engage in violence because they've experienced violence or trauma. They might sell drugs or sex to make money. They target people who have been dehumanized because those people are relatively powerless, right? The idea is to present, prevent and reduce and address harm, right? This means acknowledging that the carceral state fails on its own terms. It doesn't prevent all those awful things. And it sometimes even produces those awful things. Um, it promises security rather than safety um, and it doesn't provide it. The harshness of the system comes after the harm occurs not to prevent it, right? So it's a policy of failure. Um, the notion in part is that by doing so, it will deter it from happening in the future, but there's, excuse me, precious little evidence that that's true. Another thing to remember about abolition is that you often get the question, what are you going to replace police with? And the idea is, is it's not a single thing. Abolition is a framework. It's not a single policy. It's not to say we're going to replace a prison with this and pol police with this, and then that's all. It actually understands that we have a whole host of problems that are being dealt with in different ways, and we're going to try to deal with them in ways that make sense, right, rather than all under a single heading. So these are some of the problems that police and prisons are supposed to address, right? And you can see this is a pretty wide range of things. Um, so you may be familiar with most of these. Broken windows, just if you don't know, is this notion that when you have um, broken windows on a city street or trash or things like that, graffiti, that this indicates to everyone, this is a theory around policing, that um, the neighborhood is kind of on decline and that it encourages people to commit crime. Um, interestingly enough, the, um, that does not lead people to say that they should fix the broken windows, which seems like the obvious solution, but in fact that police should be engaging in going after people for low level what's called quality of life crimes, um, which never made any sense to me. They should fix the windows in that case. Um, but each of these things you might say there's um, one, sometimes they're not actually problems. Um, sometimes they're only problems sometimes. But many of them, you might think, hopefully, that police are not exactly well suited to address them, nor is necessarily punishment and violence the appropriate response. So um, for example, with drugs, some drug use is harmful, some drug use is not. When it is harmful, it seems to me the solution to that is to provide people treatment to make it available, um, which would be much easier if it wasn't criminalized and if people didn't have to so often pay for it on their own dime. Um, we allow many people to use drugs. Police do not bother them. If you look at where um, drug enforcement happens, it's very racialized, it's very classed. Um, and it suggests that maybe it's not the underlying drug use that is the issue. Um, homelessness. This is a real tough one. It seems to me the solution to homelessness is providing people homes. Um, the idea that cops harassing homeless people is going to lead them to like clean themselves up, get a job and find an apartment seems to me pretty far-fetched. And yet cops do that. They, um, they do see as controlling the movement of pe homeless people and trying and the idea of that punitiveness to get people on the right track. Um, Police would seem to me to be particularly ill-suited to deal with something like mental illness, which requires, you know, say, mental health counselors um, that can help people, something that is only available to some um, instead of widely available to all. A really good example is that I don't have on the list, but I'll mention is truancy. And so Gilmore, who I mentioned before, talks about people who were concerned about their children. Um, this is a poor black neighborhood. Um, they said that their kids were missing class, they were less likely to graduate, they were therefore more likely to end up in prison, so they were having a truancy problem. 
And so they were engaging with Gilmore who asked, well, why was this happening? So she engaged the, the students to try and understand this. And what she learned is there was a huge problem with asthma. Um, so it was a health problem that was heavily driving this. Um, why did so many of these children have, school children have asthma? It was because of pollution, which tends to be um, targeted in um, racially and class done in ways, right? So what these kids needed is they needed a cleaner environment and they needed healthcare, right? So there clearly was harm related to truancy, but it seemed like an obvious better ways to get there that you wouldn't think to ask about if you presume that the problem is that people need to be criminalized. And again, something that you would only do to some populations and not others. So the other thing about abolition is that it is um, what I would call a lens, a lens about how we think about reforms. There's a notion among some that abolitionists are anti-reform, which I don't think is quite right. Um, I would say that they are against reformist reforms. Those are the sort of reforms that try and patch up the system. They're in favor of non-reformist reforms that are designed to, um, through the making and demanding of it, as well as through their enactment, they undermine the system that's targeted rather than trying to um, reinforce it. So they can improve things in the short term, but they also build power for the longer term to try and make those bigger changes. I have here a simple guide for evaluating any suggested reforms of police in the US. Um, this comes again from Mariam Kaba. Um, she says, these are the questions you should ask. Uh, this is something she did a number of years ago. So the questions are, are the proposed reforms allocating more money to the police? You would be amazed at how many policing reforms involve giving more money to police at a time when police are getting a ton of public money and many other public services are being cut. Um, something that's become much worse even over the last couple of months um, as a result of COVID-19. Okay, number two, are the proposed reforms advocating for more police and policing under euphemistic terms like community policing run out of regular police districts? So the idea here is that oftentimes people are kind of providing a kind of PR label on top of something, but the actual thing they're calling for is more police and policing. And that obviously um, is troubling if your goal is to reduce policing or get rid of it. Another question she asks is, are the proposed reforms primarily technology focused? Part of the reason is that definitely means more money for police. Um, but she also said that in general, that technology is gonna be turned towards the public rather than used against cops. So for example, think of body cams. Body cams were something that came in the wake of the Black Lives Matter movement. The idea was police were gonna wear body cams and that was gonna reduce police brutality. Instead, the camera is turned on the civilian instead of on the police. Now, to mention the fact that they can turn them off, which is something that happens a lot, um, and that the police control the footage. So this has not actually been very effective at all in reducing um, police violence. Um, then the next question is, the final question, are the proposed reforms focused on individual dialogues with individual cops, and will those dialogues be funded with tax dollars? And what she said here is, I'm never against dialogue. It's always good to talk to people. But those conversations shouldn't be tax funded, right? We need that money for other things. It would be better spent elsewhere. But also, if violence is endemic to US policing is itself, the fact that there are some nice individuals who work in police departments, um, she says she's even met some of them, um, but that doesn't change anything, right? So this is what we call, this reinforces something called the bad apples theory of oppressive policing. That is that the vast majority of police are good and there's this small number of bad apples. Ironically, the metaphor of the bad apple is that a single bad apple in the barrel spoils the whole bunch. So if we know, or if we were to argue that there are bad apples in policing and they're allegedly responsible for these problems, and the police are not doing anything about removing them, the metaphor suggests that that means that policing itself is rotten. Strangely, no one thinks about that. Um, but fundamentally, this isn't a problem of individually terrible officers. It's a problem of um, the system itself. Right. Um, so what sort of reforms would pass this test? The decriminalization of non-harmful or maybe even harmful things, reducing the power of police to stop people or cars, reducing their power to arrest, reducing the length of sentencing, allowing people to call for help without involving the cops. We're going to come back to that. These are the sorts of things that would pass that test. But what we're seeing in this moment is a whole lot of reforms being proposed 
that fail across the board in here, that there were the exact sort of same things that were proposed in the wake of Ferguson. They were the exact sort of things that were proposed in various iterations before um, without any real significant um, change. Uh, the city of Minneapolis, which is where George Floyd was killed, has a long history of being a center of many of these policing reforms. Um, they had um, implicit bias trainings and you know, increased professionalism and all that sort of thing. And yet here we are, it did not make a difference. Um, and I would argue because it fundamentally misunderstood what the problem was, okay? So I wanna talk now about some of the big questions we haven't talked about yet, I mentioned before. Because if you have a conversation with someone about abolition, this is usually where people's mind go first. And I wanted to talk for a while before we got here, but I did promise we would get here. So these are the sort of things that many people say, well, this, I can't go any farther than that. They may be perfectly fine with not using police and prisons to address a whole host of problems that currently are being dealt by those things. But they have the sense that there are this um, core of fundamental, rather common violent problems that we need to resolve through policing. Okay, so let's take them in turn. What about rape? I find this particular one strange if we give it any thought because rape and sexual assault seem to be an area that seems most obvious that the existence, existing system does not work, right? Um, there has been many stories of piled up rape tests, go, tests going untested. We know that the vast majority of instances of this go unreported. We know that one of the reasons that happens is that victims are often treated very poorly by the police and by the entire system itself, right? That hasn't stopped people from trying to articulate solutions that involve police and prisons to this problem. Um, this has been labeled by some carceral feminism. Carceral feminism, abolitionists would argue, has a tendency to reproduce the existing inequalities in the system, right? Many key abolitionist organizers and theorists are themselves people who came to abolition from the sexual, um, the anti-sexual violence movement. Um, it is not because they don't care about this, it's because they care about it so much and recognized how poorly the existing system does in dealing with it. Um, Andy Smith has said that this is a problem of political organizing and not one of punishment. That is, how can we organize to make interpersonal violence unthinkable, right? Uh, one of the reasons for this, we might think about this is again, what I said about policy of failure. So the whole thing is first the bad thing happens and then the system comes into action. Rapists generally do not fear that they're gonna be punished because so few of them are. Um, you might compare this to say, trying to address this problem in part through bystander intervention. What if all of us were trained to notice when a likely problem is happening and how to intervene to stop a bad thing like sexual assault from happening? Then we don't have to call the police in and have them be everywhere all at once because we're all there trying to solve that problem collectively um, with training um, that we don't all have now. What about murder? The United States has particularly harsh laws. It also has particularly high murder rates. Uh, many murders go unsolved. Um, the places that are most heavily policed tend to be places that have particularly high levels of unsolved murder. Um, the things that lead people to murder, well, trauma, um, which is a major problem, poverty. Um, we can address these sort of things. Um, we can also think about the ways that many people kind of graduate from smaller levels of violence on up. Um, murders, um, often don't start there. Um, and so we might think about whether we can intervene in conflicts earlier, whether we can deal with uh, mental health issues earlier and all those sorts of things. The idea being to reduce the likelihood that happens in the first place instead of waiting for it to happen and then dealing with it. Um, what about serial killers? Uh, I started with TV and I'm gonna go back to it. On TV, there are serial killers everywhere. They pray um, that they are, you can, turn on TV at any moment and you can see shows about serial killers. They, um, they're depicted as brilliant um, and um, the, the police are um, using all this high-end science to try and find them in psychology and stuff. Most of that is nonsense, it's not real. Um, in reality, serial killers to the extent they exist, um, mostly there's not a lot of this, but to the extent it exists, um, the definition is someone that kills like 
two or three people over like a period of like a month or two or something like that, um, which isn't normally what most of us might think of. Um, but actual people in this category tend to prey on the weak and vulnerable. They often escalate again from smaller acts, but there's no systems in place to catch that and intervene. Um, and what one of the ways we might deal with it is that we could deal with the situation of people that are weak and vulnerable. They are not typically brilliant. They are typically people who go after people that society doesn't care about. And that's why they're able to get away with it as long as they can. Um, it suggests that it's a larger problem of inequality. I would argue that police and prisons are bad at addressing any of these things. And that in addition, most police activity has nothing to do with this or other serious crimes, right? It's much more about so-called low level things um, and um, that sort of thing. So abolitionists cannot promise that we won't have any of these things happen. Of course, the status quo can't either. Many of these problems, well, two of the three problems are endemic, right? Um, but the idea is that maybe we can deal with them somewhat more effectively and reduce them on the front end, okay? We're, you might be thinking, what sort of things can you do about this? This all could seem beyond your capacity to, to do anything. One of the first things you can do is that you cannot call the police or strive not to call the police. So this is a little guide that was put together to help people, because one of the things you might think about, think about the George Floyd case. Um, George Floyd had the cops called on him because he passed what was a, I believe a counterfeit 20. He may or may not have realized that. He might have been the one that got it in the first place. There's a law in Minneapolis that required the store to call the cops when they received that bill. And the result of that was he was killed by the police. The store owner who did that has now said that he will never do that again. They will not call the cops. Um, and they've apologized profusely to the community. Um, this is a thing that's happened before. We've seen instances of someone calling the police to try and get help for them, sometimes even, and seeing it end in violence. Anytime you call the cops, you run the risk that someone's gonna die, um, and particularly some people over others, right? So what this chart is a way of thinking through um, steps you can ask yourself before calling the police, right? And so many people would call the police and these other sorts of ideas, but this, this is saying, you know, there's other things you can do. And it gives you this step-by-step -step guide. And part of it is you can see, this isn't just an individual level thing. So we get down to the third option, would be like, is this something that you can handle collectively or do you need a professional, right? So part of the idea here is that there's other professional resources we should be able to call in situations when there's a problem. Right. If you call 911, odds are the police are coming. But what do you do when you have a situation where you don't want the police to come? You just have someone that needs help. Right. Or maybe it's a situation that, you know, you need help, but you don't want it to end in that way. So the idea is both that we can be trained up ourselves to make these sort of choices, that we can be organized with our own community to try and deal with problems, and that we can have government um, resources devoted to help us solve our problems um, without involving the police, thereby increasing the likelihood that it doesn't end in violence. This is a small thing, but it's particularly helpful, I think. Um, and again, the point is not just, oh, you act differently, but it's partly also about changing the conditions for your, yourself and your neighborhood and your community and your city to allow for that. Um, so I, I have next, the thing I wanna show you is some graphics. Um, these were developed, um, they're inspired by Mariam Kaba, who I mentioned before. Um, and the artist who created them is Luna um, Sinanite. Um, and what they are is a couple um, instances to help us envision an abolitionist future. So the idea here is not like me or anyone else just giving you the answers. It's an invitation for us to think collectively about how we might handle problems differently and what precisely we want out of public safety. So for example, we have here, if you're experiencing intimate partner violence, intimate partner violence, imagine texting a number and a trauma-informed crisis intervention specialist meets you in a safe place. An hour later, you're working together to make a plan that will keep you safe long-term. Isn't that public safety? 
someone is behaving erratically and in harm's way. Imagine texting a number and an unarmed agent, <laughs> urgent responder, trained in behavioral and mental health comes within five minutes. An hour later, that person is, is safe and getting the support they need. Isn't that public safety? Here we're getting into kind of more traditional police type stuff. Someone seems to be snooping in car windows on your block. Imagine calling your neighbors who are trained in self-defense and de-escalation and approaching that person. An hour later, the conflict is resolved and the person responsible is getting the support they need. Isn't that public safety? Um, these again are meant to kind of help us think through this and think through what it is we actually want. And, in terms of public safety and whether we actually think that police and prisons are the way to do those sorts of things. Um, I believe they're not, but I think it's really helpful, even if you're not so sure about that, to ask these sort of questions. Because even if you're not willing to go the full step of being an abolitionist, um, it's worth kind of expanding your notion of how you would think through these sort of problems, right? You know, worst case scenario is you agree that we need to drastically reduce these systems maybe. Um, and find other ways of dealing with these problems. Because again, it's not just about what we don't do, it's about shifting our resources and how we solve problems. Okay? Almost to the end. So I wanna talk a little bit about the relationship between abolition and socialism. Um, hopefully by now, if you're, if you're familiar with the notion of socialism, this is making a lot of sense. All right, so, Capitalism places profit um, as the primary goal of the system, right? Whereas socialism places meeting human needs at the center, right? So what we're talking about here, when we talk about the shift from capitalism to socialism is a shift to meeting human needs um, and reducing um, domination and oppression. Um, we are talking about addressing deep inequalities directly rather than trying to manage the consequences of those deep inequalities, we're talking about ending them. Um, and I think when we describe it this way, we see, to my mind, the connection between abolition and socialism, um, that uh, all those sort of things that abolitions are talking about, of like changing um, where the resources are going and how we solve those problems, are, I would argue, about building a socialist world. Uh, there are some people that think that um, abolition just means anarchism, um, there's certainly plenty of anarchists who are uh, abolitionists, but plenty of people who aren't as well. Um, I don't think it follows that if we don't have police and prisons, that there is no government, there is no state, which is a whole other complicated question that I'll save for a different session. So I'm going to show you some additional readings. Um, Anything I do here is just the beginning because um, I am not, uh, there's plenty of better people out there to hear this from me. I hope what I've been able to give you is a kind of beginning notion of these sort of ideas. But if you're really interested in it, I would encourage you to continue on and to learn from some of these people that have been doing it um, for a long time, both the intellectual work and the organizing. Um, often these are the same people. So at the top, we have Angela Davis, her book, Our Prisons Obsolete, very short, very readable. Um, it's a great place to start. Um, we have Ruth Wilton Gilmore, who I've quoted a couple times. Her book, Golan Gulag, is about how California shifted to having this massive prison system, something that happened um, beginning in the 60s and 70s, um, at the same time they saw a massive disinvestment from things like uh, public education. Um, there's an interview here from Mariam Kaba in The Next System, which um, is really a good, another good helpful starting place about what this all means. Um, there's this piece in Jacobin by Kaba and also Erica Miners called Arresting the Carceral State. I mentioned carceral feminism, so you can learn more about that from Victoria Law. I mentioned this Beth Rishi book before, it's called Arrested Justice, Black Women Violence in America's Next uh, Prison Nation. Um, and then Alex Vital's book, End of Policing, um, which I believe is free as an ebook right now from uh, Verso, um, is another thing I would highly recommend. He, um, the book, End of Policing, is partly that he's saying that the problem is the end, the purpose of policing, so which is why we need to stop having these reformist reforms. But he takes you through a number of these sort of like, here's how we deal with this problem, and here's why the police and prisons is a particularly good solution, and here are what those other things might look like. So it's a very kind of practical guide to asking through some of these questions. Um, there's plenty of 
like abolition syllabi and things like that out there, um, which are great. Um, a lot of times these sort of things are very long and detailed. So you might wanna start with some of these things, but work your way out there. There's lots of elements of abolition I didn't cover tonight because um, there is really a lot to talk about. Um, but I hope that what we've done here gives you a, a basic sense of what this is all about. Um, and maybe helps make sense of why we're hearing so much more about abolition in this particular moment as we're seeing mass unrest around the country um, sparked by the killing of um, George Floyd, um, but raising questions far beyond that. Um, with that, I'm gonna turn it back to Abel, who is going to um, take your questions and direct them to me. Hey, can you, can you hear me? I can. Okay, great. Um, Abel, I think, is actually having a, um, a sound issue real quick, but he sent over the list. Um, so okay. there you go. Hello, uh, Abel. Sorry about that. Okay, I'll start over. Uh, thank, uh, thank you again, David, for uh, that great presentation. And thank you to everyone who has submitted questions. Uh, please continue to uh, submit questions if you have anything on your mind, and we'll try to get through as many of them as we can. Uh, one common question that several people submitted, um, and I'll just read this uh, out. Uh, regarding rape, I entirely agree that the current system is wholly inadequate, but I also don't know how effective bystander training would be in reducing all rape from happening, particularly considering the fact that most rape happens in interpersonal relationships slash behind closed doors. Could you expand on this? Yeah, um, one of the things with all, that's a good question. One of the things with all these sort of things is that I think I mentioned, this is never about finding the one neat trick. Um, it's about understanding these are all complex problems and we probably need lots of things. So I would say bystander intervention is a helpful thing. Um, it is not gonna be limited to kind of things that happen wholly in public because ideally people would be trained in noticing when their friends' relationships were getting abusive. Um, they may be able to help them. Um, but that's only one thing. Um, and you're absolutely right, on its own, not enough. Um, what other things might we have? Well, one is make it um, one of the means by which this becomes particularly likely to happen in an interpersonal situation is through both physical and economic control. So having people who you know, I mentioned with the um, one of those graphics that talks about this, where ideally, if you were having a problem, you could call in other people to support you. Um, they can intervene in a particular moment, which is a little different than bystander training, but they also would have the capacity to help get you set up um, to you know, move out, to find a way to have an income that isn't dependent on that person, right? So I, again, not perfect, not, will not solve these sort of problems, but we know that one of the means by which um, this is able to occur and just broadly you know, controlling behavior of all sorts is gonna come both through physical and economic control. And so those are things we can interrupt, um, but possibly not through policing. Now, we see a lot of um, signs on the street saying some variation of ACAB, all cops are bad. Uh, now, some people might be saying this in jest, but could you expand on perhaps why people are using that phrase? Sure, I can, I can give you my take. Um, one is that um, just as a, as a general matter, in moments like this, when we're seeing kind of large scale protests, um, the police tend to take it as a personal affront um, especially when they're the targets of the protest. Um, and they often engage in behavior that makes people angry, right? So one of the things that people think is there's this clean dividing line between peaceful protests and violent riots or what have you. And I would argue most of the time what happens is that police do things 
um, they, es they have a tendency to escalate um, in these sort of situations, especially on this issue. Um, that, and then that causes kind of overreaction on their part. So I would say it's understandable that people get angry in those moments and that they get angry when they see just this litany of names that I talked about, for example, and the same kind of reforms chatted out the same, like we didn't know this was a problem or now we think it's a problem, kind of really um, a lot of really symbolic reactions. So, you know, if have instances of police officers getting pictured, like taking a knee, um, and that's supposed to make us feel better about the fact that someone was killed previously, that they're gonna turn around and um, over police the protests, it's unclear what that's supposed to do. Um, I think the other element of this is that so often when you, not just as an abolitionist, but any sort of criticism of policing, um, the reaction is often to, um, people will tell you, but there are good cops. Um, and I, you know, for me, I would go back to the quote, what I was quoting from Maryam Kaba is like, that's fine. I, I'm not gonna tell you that's not real, I don't know. But it doesn't matter, it's irrelevant because it's a system problem. So I think one, my understanding of one of the things that ACAB comes from is it's a reaction to this constant push that there are good cops um, and that somehow that matters um, in the grand scheme of things. For me, I don't think it's relevant. I also think it's interesting um, that the interrogation technique of good cop, bad cop is that a bad cop does the awful things and the good cop then uses that as a way to get what they want out of you. And so I always think about that when people are pushing this notion of the good cop. Um, yeah. Well, I think that segues really nicely into our, uh, the next question. Could you briefly explain the concept of qualified immunity and how that prevents citizens from receiving justice in the face of police misconduct? Um, I will. I'm not a lawyer, so I'm going to be. I'm going to do this at a pretty high level of abstraction. Um, but in essence. Um, The just as the Supreme Court have developed this doctrine basically that says that just because a police officer violates your rights doesn't mean that you have uh, recourse essentially against them personally. So um, one of the main things that limits it is that there's this notion that unless there was a clear already, I think I'm getting this language mostly right, paraphrasing, like a clear already articulated um, rule from like prior judicial rulings that was violated, then you can't hold the cop accountable. There's some really ridiculous instances of that. There was one recently where the cops um, pretended to do, they were doing a search and they found uh, something of value, I think it was money, and they stole the money. They didn't log in at evidence, they just stole it. And so the person sued and the court said, well, you know, we've never had a case that said the cops can't steal the money when they're doing a search. So they're immune. Um, th my understanding basically is that um, as is that judges have tied themselves into knots to avoid police um, ever being held accountable, and so it's exceedingly. Still there? Yep. I'm sorry. So I I think Jen, the the big takeaway is that. Um, these rules make it really difficult for anyone to hold anyone accountable. Um, and in addition to that, oftentimes the, the cities themselves are indemnifying um, officers. That is that they're the ones that pay out um, when there's a problem. Cities pay out all sorts of money for police violating people's rights, um, some, whether it's at the individual level or at the, at the policy level. And they don't seem to have any deterrent effect as near as I can tell. Several people are asking for examples of uh, quote unquote non-reformist reforms or um, other countries, places, uh, municipalities that may be um, engaging in some of these ideas that we may be able to you know, cite to their friends who may be new to the idea of police um, abolition. Are there any examples of uh, anything close to these ideas um, coming to practice? So that's a good question. And the, so I think the short answer is, is that um, 
the United States is kind of an outlier when it comes to these sort of things. Um, and if you look at the places we're most similar to, it tends to be other settler colonial places like Australia or like the UK, or the UK which doesn't count there. Um, there's pretty wide variation in, around the globe in terms of how people deal with these sort of things and the, the role of policing or prisons, which are institutions that have basically been adopted or imposed as a result of the expansion of capitalism through imperialism and colonialism, that sort of thing. Um, of the places where it's been rolled, I, I'm not familiar as much with places where it's been rolled back, although um, I can think of some in the United States we might think of. So for example, um, this is a real, um, it's a small scale one, but it's interesting. In LA, they were gonna try and build another jail, another prison, they have tons in California. Um, and so very recently there was a campaign where they um, stopped the building of the jail and they got the city to um, agree to redirect that money to go towards a mental health facility. They said, we don't need more space to lock people up and that we'd go to that. Um, in Chicago, uh, there was the, inst uh, the case of um, John Burge. John Burge was a, um, a, a detective in Chicago, PD, um, who basically ran a, a torture facility to interrogate people, basically to solicit false confessions to be able to put them in prison or put other people in prison. Um, abolitionist organizing that happened in Chicago um, succeeded in getting reparations for the victims of John Birch. Um, they also got um, a curriculum introduced into Chicago public schools to teach about this problem, to try and um, address it in the future. Um, they also uh, took out the prosecutor um, politically um, who um, was very uninterested in holding cops accountable, but was very punitive towards the community. And so they organized something called the Buy Anita campaign for Anita Alvarez. Um, the idea was is that you had a lot of people who weren't necessarily in favor of this other person who was running, but they wanted to get rid of this person and they were successful in doing that. So those are some of the examples I would say. A lot of um, abolitionist stuff that's happening in the United States, which often involves, includes people who aren't abolitionists, is about trying to stop the building of prisons and jails and to take that money and redirect it into meeting needs in other ways. Now, what are uh, what can be done to avoid a situation where we um, essentially get rid of prisons and deal with mental health issues by only creating mental health prisons, so to speak? This is a really good question. I'm glad you asked that because I should have mentioned this already. Um, there's a campaign going on now. I think we're going to talk that's happening nationwide, but there's also one in D.C. about um, the demand of defunding police departments. So the idea is um, not, at least in the short term, that we're just gonna have no police departments, but that we're gonna significantly cut their budgets. Right now, this is a big problem because every city is, um, has lost tremendous revenue as a result of the recession caused by COVID-19. Um, and most cities, including DC, are talking about increasing the money that goes towards police and prisons um, while drastically cutting social services, that's a serious problem. And so the idea of defunding the, P, the police departments is about redirecting that money, choose other sorts of things. But it is absolutely true that when we talk about being against police and prisons, we're not talking about the buildings themselves. We're not talking about those labels. We're talking about the kind of social relations where, that, that are subject there. So if you think about school discipline, something I mentioned before, how is that dealt with in most schools? It's dealt with by cops. We have schools with cops. Not everyone gets that, right? If you're poor, you're more likely to get it. Black and brown students are more likely to get it. Um, we have different ways we deal with that for other people, but we um, don't provide that to everyone. So money for schools, yes, but we also want to remove the cops from the schools. Um, mental health, yes, but it has to be um, not policing, it has to be not um, confinement. And so the idea is to make lots of these things available and um, uh, make them enticing to people that actually want to do it because, you know, the sort of treatment we give to people who pay for it themselves, um, which is much better and appealing. And so it's absolutely true that it's just not enough to just redirect that money, that we can't recreate those conditions. And we also have to understand that currently that's a problem in all sorts of institutions, whether they have actual police 
in those institutions, um, or whether it's just that um, people are detained and treated the same sorts of ways. Um, so the, the organizing project has to include all those things as well. Um, not, it's never just that focus on the institutions of police and prisons. Right. Uh, here's another interesting question that we received. While I understand that in a society that works to prevent these problems, there will, uh, will inevitably still have some violent crimes. So how are we to respond when a person poses an imminent danger to a person or community, such as mass shooters? Uh, who will be responsible for crimes that require investigations when preventative measures don't work? Okay, so the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna replace the word crime with harm in that question. Uh, which I encourage you to do always, and then see if it still makes sense. In this case, it does. Um, mass shootings is a really interesting thing. Um, in most of the world, there's no such thing. Um, in the United States is a real outlier here. Um, doesn't mean it doesn't exist anywhere else, but there's many places on this planet where that's just not a thing. So I'm unconvinced that that's not a thing that could be stopped. There's also not always a thing in the United States, at least in the way we normally mean it. Um, you might think I'm overly idealistic there, but I just don't think, I think we'd be careful about thinking that um, things about the United States in our particular historical context are universal. I'm not convinced they are. But the other question is a good one. So like, let's just say that someone is doing something like shooting, like what do you do? Well, pr one thing is you want de-escalation tactics. In theory, many police are trained on this. In practice, it often doesn't go that way. There was a case a couple years back in West Virginia um, that I can't stop thinking about where there was a, a police officer who had been trained in de-escalation tactics and there was someone who was in some sort of mental health crisis and they were waving a gun around. Um, and he used his de-escalation training to get that person to not, you know, to put the gun down and surrender, which to me was a hero. Um, he was fired. He was fired because he didn't just shoot the person. Um, would de-escalation tactics work in any, in any instance? Not necessarily. Um, but again, I think we've got all the preventative stuff. And then in those sorts of moments, we would want de-escalation tactics. We want lots of people trained in that. And then past a certain point, yeah, it's like you need something else. But I don't know. Ideally, you know, the person gets tackled or something like that rather than killed. Um, but Again, the point is not that it, um, there'd be no point at which we'd get to that. It's largely about um, trying to reduce that as little as possible. And then we would wanna think about what that would have to be organized to look like so that it wouldn't recreate the same dynamics of policing. And you know, I think all of this is a difficult question. Like I, I, I've said those things as my answers, but I don't think like, oh, that's, that's just easy. Um, I think it's important for us to kind of take seriously these problems and think through them. But again, I don't think the current system we have is doing a very good job of it. Um, so I think we could do at least a lot better. So I think one of the most vital steps to, or questions to ask, and this might be not something you have a complete answer to. I think it's a question that collectively we'll all have to kind of work hard towards answering, but what are the steps that we all can take now to start working towards police abolition? Mm -hmm. So at the bigger level, I think there's gonna be a series of demands made in this particular moment. Um, and we need to be able to sort those into whether they, they make sense to press or not. I think defunding, especially if we understand it properly, is a really good one. Um, a lot of the other stuff is not. Um, and so, you know, trying to, you know, essentially point out that these things have been tried and without success um, seems to me an important one. I also think that a lot of people, this notion of there's things that policing shouldn't be do resonates with a lot of people. Even police will sometimes talk about this. So you hear a lot from police and police, you know, advocates kind of saying like, oh, we're asked to do so many things. We're asked to solve all society's problems. And I think what they, I mean, what I, I always took away from that is like, I'm supposed to say, okay, so it's okay. You can do whatever the hell you want. I mean, my answer is like, great, let's take some of these problems off your shoulders, like, and, and some of the money so we can deal with that. So the whole list of the homelessness is my prime example. Like, I think for m many people, 
if you talk it through, it's pretty obvious that providing people homes is a solution to homelessness and making sure that housing is affordable is a way you can deal with homelessness and like chasing people away from where they're sleeping or destroying their stuff isn't going to make anyone like have a home. So I think one of the things you can do is just think about the things like that, um, where it maybe is easiest to imagine an alternative solution. Um, and one of the keys is to make sure that we're not running that solution through policing. So a lot of times people are like, you're right. Cops aren't trained to deal with mental health. That's why we're going to have mental health training for police or mental health counselors who work for the police department. It's like, no, just like separate them entirely and have a way that we can call them in. Um, so challenging this notion that everything has to be run through the police and talking about things that we can pull out of that, the like low hanging fruit. Um, and I also think it's helpful to talk with people. The, the chart I showed of mass incarceration is something that I think a lot of people understand that, um, that we've had this massive increase in punitiveness. And I don't think the problem is like a, that they don't understand, it's that they've been trained to then offer inadequate solutions. The sort of like, well, you know, let's reduce mass incarceration. So I think encouraging to think about, well, do you think that's gonna solve the problem um, is a good way for them to work it out for themselves. Um, yeah. One, um, well, you know, when we're talking about the distinction between non-reformist uh, non reforms, uh, one thing that we have to worry about are like kind of the uh, barriers that we're going to face. We know uh, how entrenched some of the powers to be can be, um, you know, in our current world. Uh, to that point, uh, somebody asked, what do you see as the role of courts in abolition? Uh, the U.S. in particular has such a complicated, multi-tiered federal versus state uh, court system, each with its own rules, crimes, et cetera. How would these need to evolve or be uh, entirely replaced in a new system? Yeah, I mean, when I, so my vision of abolition includes getting rid of criminal courts because their job is to process people, to punish and um, cage. Um, I think that uh, they are, they don't work according to what they're supposed to either, the kind of stated justifications for them. Um, the way that um, the court system works, the judicial system works, is that there, I would say, there's not a lot of concern for getting the right person or making sure that they've been charged with the right thing. Um, in DC, the last time I looked, it's been a little while, 99% of felonies cases are resolved without a trial. So all the things we think of they show on TV or you learn about in school about rights and like due process and all that sort of thing, basically irrelevant to almost everybody. And who's the ones that are left in that category? It's like rich white people. Um, your ordinary person who gets caught up in this system um, is being processed largely by prosecutors and police and the judge is kind of operating in a kind of rubber stamp. Um, I said before that I think um, the judicial doctrines have really just um, been courts tying themselves in knots just to justify the system. Um, there was a, a case famously, and I'm going to get my years wrong, so I won't um, guess, um, that was uh, challenging the death penalty for being uh, racist, essentially pointing out racial disparities throughout the system of the death penalty system. And essentially what the justices said was, if we were to entertain this notion that we could get rid of the death penalty because of the racial disparities, it would call into question the entire system. And we can't do that. So we're not going to do anything about the death penalty. Um, you might have concluded from that that you have a much bigger problem, but they, they said no. I'm very skeptical that the courts are a particularly useful venue for trying to um, address any of these problems. And fundamentally, I think they're like the criminal courts are among the things that abolitionists would seek to abolish um, over time. And, you know, when we're talking about moving things out of the realm of policing responsibility and prison responsibility, we're also talking about removing it from the realm of ju judicial responsibility, um, which I think is warranted. Okay, quick note, several folks are sending in questions asking for some of the uh, infographics uh, from this presentation to be shared later. 
uh, I believe we will we'll be posting all of these infographics on Twitter after our presentation. So make sure you're following the uh, Socialist Night School on Twitter that uh, I'll post the um, exact, uh, uh, the full name of that on the chat and uh, we'll read that out loud uh, shortly. If you don't have Twitter, let me check back into you uh, in a moment and we'll come up with a plan to distribute some of those infographics because I know a lot of those would be helpful to folks, especially going over the ones on how to um, deal, uh, other ways to deal with police if you're in situations, things to consider. Uh, in the meantime, what, how would you frame the abolition, uh, abolition or regulation of surveillance by policing institutions? I know the surveillance of uh, all countries around the world, especially in uh, you know so-called first world countries have only been increasing. How can, how does this tie into police abolition? Yeah, that's a very good question too. Um, when I often kind of think of this in terms of like punishment and confinement and surveillance, um, I think that's a key part of it. Um, in theory, surveillance is limited by the Fourth Amendment to the Constitution. And what has happened um, over time is that um, basically, again, courts have bent over backwards to try and justify what police are doing, what the, the FBI is doing, what the, the federal government is doing when it comes to like terrorism and, and all those sorts of things, um, right? These um, lots of problems that we don't normally think of policing or under prisons are related to that immigration, so-called anti-terrorism, you know, things like that. Um, and surveillance is a key piece of all of that. And basically what's ended up happening is that um, these problems are constructed and these groups of people are demonized. Um, and we've had a massive expansion of surveillance and of detention and all these sorts of things. It's unclear that any of these things have actually improved any of these problems, even on the, the measure, the way that they would count it. Like for example, I don't think immigration is a problem, but you know, all the stories we've done, you know, in terms of militarizing the border, which includes a lot of surveillance, for example, hasn't actually reduced the number of people crossing. Um, so in general, one of the things I think for any of these sorts of things is we wanna think about um, root causes of problems. When it comes to terrorism in the United States, we have, um, you know, uh, that sort of stuff that is related to the the situation in the Middle East, it seems to me pretty obvious that the United States will withdraw um, its military troops from these places and stop supporting dictatorships in all these countries that people in those places would be less likely to want to blow us up, um, dealing with the root of the problem. Um, when it comes to immigration, um, again, I don't think immigration is a problem, but I do think it's a problem that many people in the um, in Mexico, Central America, and South America basically feel they are forced to leave where they live to come to the United States because there's no, that they have better jobs, the possibility of making money when they don't have that possibility there. Um, there's the violence of the war on drugs, the US war on drugs, we're supporting a lot of violence in those places. Um, there's the trade deals that um, harm people economically. There's all these sorts of ways that uproot, uproot people and cause them to move. Um, I think if they want to move here, that's great, but we shouldn't be trying to force them to move and then getting mad when they do. So these are root problems we can address. Um, and I think the same is true, like um, on TV, whenever there's a problem, they like just type into like some database and it's like, you know, there's databases for everything and every purse, every criminal is in there. Um, the reality is, is to the extent these things exist, they tend to really sweep up way too many people. You have people in gang databases that are like four. You have people on the terror watch list who are like 88 or a US senator. Um, these systems are, don't make any sense. And, you know, like one of the things that civil liberties groups try and do is they try and get um, all of these things to focus on when there's a real suspicion that someone is doing something like or planning something that is a serious problem. And like, if you really believed in policing, that would seem to make sense. Um, but it isn't the way these systems operate. Um, so what they end up doing, I think, is kind of just being generalized social control targeting of criminalized populations. So I think drastically rolling back surveillance is an absolutely important thing. There's plenty of people who are in favor of that who are not abolitionists, but I certainly see that as part of the project.
Okay, we uh, only have time for one more question. So, uh, David, I'm sorry, we'll end it off with a really difficult question. Awesome. Um, a lot of people are going to want to walk away from this presentation and uh, hopefully be able to convince perhaps their more liberal or even conservative friends that um, uh, about the whole idea of uh, police abolition. And you know, hopefully the, this whole presentation has given you um, some of the tools and ideas to do that. But if you had to do uh, a short elevator pitch to kind of punch in that idea, does anything come to mind? I do think that, I think of this as a challenge of organizing. Um, and so it's, I don't have an elevator pitch because I think it really depends on the person. And so instead of kind of coming to someone and saying like, you should accept that abolition is good, here's why. I think engaging them with like, well, what are you concerned about? Are you really concerned about that? Or are you concerned about this other thing? And then thinking about the answers you might give that are specific to them, right? Um, and not assuming that you know the answer. Um, and then kind of like giving them the space to work through it, I think will tend to be more effective. When it comes to the label itself, I think um, the, there is a notion sometimes that like um, we have to avoid taking stances that are like extreme or we're gonna scare people off. Um, the right decided that that wasn't true a really long time ago and they've been pretty effective. I'm not convinced it's true. Um, I do think that when you, um, in this moment, for example, even mild criticism of the police or the suggestion that maybe the protesters have some, something there or what have you, will be met with a tremendous amount of hostility from some people. They think any sort of criticism is, is illegitimate. If that's the case, then that kind of frees you up because if you know you're gonna get it from those people no matter what, why not take a stronger position than the milk toast one that's designed to win them over, um, right? The other thing I think is that there's, there's a way that we can relate to people where there's a difference between um, like planting a flag in someone's face and being like, I'm an abolitionist versus like thinking of like planting the flag to your side and being like, well, I'm an abolitionist and here's why. You can talk about like your reasons, what brings you to this, right? The standard organizing conversation. But when you do it that way, my experience is, is you've created space for someone to kind of come towards you. Um, and I think that that tends to be more effective. And then the other thing is, is that like some people are movable at this moment and some people aren't. So I think it's really important to kind of think of, think those through. And there are people I know who I would engage this question with, and there are other people I would not, they can engage me. And I'm just gonna kind of, you know, be like, whatever, I don't wanna talk about it because it's not worth my time. I think some people are, it's a little bit similar to the way I think about capitalism. There are people who are like pro-capitalism, ideological cap pro-capitalists. They're pretty rare. And there's a lot of other people who haven't really thought about it. I think with abolition, there's some people who they hear any whiff of this and they just shut down. I don't think you can work with those people. I mean, you can change the conditions maybe, but you can't work with them directly. And a lot of people are not anti-abolitionists. They just really haven't thought about it. And it sounds weird and kind of upsets them. But those people tend to be the ones that are movable. So I think it's important to kind of get a, a feel for people of whether they are truly ideologically committed to the idea of policing and prisons as people exist. Or if it's more that you live in a world where it's a hegemonic idea and you've never really heard any sort of criticisms and when you have, you've kind of dismissed them. What sort of people are the ones you can move? And so I think it's finding those sorts of things. Um, and a lot of what you can do doesn't have to be, I think I, it is often important to say, you know, where you're coming from, that you're an abolitionist, have that perspective, but sometimes you're just talking with someone about how to solve a problem. And so that's the other thing, is thinking about those moments that there's people I know that I might be like, hey, this, this is a bad way to solve this problem, don't you think? And they might move a little bit, but the label itself wouldn't mean anything to them. And so, you know, instead of giving you a single answer, what I'm telling you is I think um, this is the terrain and kind of how to, how to try and surf it, um, which isn't exactly what you asked, but I think it's the best answer. Okay, and with that, I'd like to uh, thank David for a great and informative uh, in, uh, 
presentation. I'd like to thank everybody who attended over here for sticking with us for uh, two hours. Uh, you are the real MVPs, the real champions. I'm sorry if we didn't get uh, a chance to get to your questions, but hopefully we'll have a few more of these presentations in the future that we can um, you know, address those too. Uh, if you are already a member with DSA, I ask, uh, I ask you to consider joining up. It's the best way to uh, stay on top of our night schools and other activism, uh, other organizing, and get plugged in. From personal experience, I can guarantee you that standing alongside comrades is the best way to be effective in making this a better world. Uh, we have a lot of coordinating going on for the protests in our chapter Slack. So if you are already a member, make sure you're paying attention to the Slack to stay on top of announcements regarding safety um, for the protests over the next few days. Um, I'll pass this along to uh, Chris uh, to make a quick announcement. Hello, uh, can you all hear me? Yes. Great. Um, well, thank you, David, and thank you, Abel. Uh, this was amazing. Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, my name is Chris. I've been a member of DSA for a few years, and uh, a group of us, uh, in response to these amazing protests over the last week, uh, along with the steering committee of our chapter, are beginning to work um, on building out a campaign to defund the MPD, the Metropolitan Police Department. Um, we know uh, from experience that policing is con concentrated in, in black and brown neighborhoods. Um, and many of us who are white uh, have little to no ex interaction with the DC cops. We know that um, the DC police budget uh, divert money from our communities. Um, they're looking for over uh, half a billion dollars in fiscal year 2021 here in DC, uh, just for the MPD. And so we want to join the call to defund the MPD and, and launch a campaign to take on uh, the police funding in our city. Um, there's also black led organizations like the Stop Police Terror Project here um, working on this. So we need to be intentional and act in solidarity, but we need to act and take on these, these really important issues. Um, so we're at the start of this project and we're launching it now, but we're also on a quick timeline. The DC Council's Judiciary Committee is currently considering the MPD's uh, fiscal year 2021 budget right now. Uh, they're accepting public submissions and comments on that budget until June 16th. So we only have two weeks to get submissions in. Uh, in theory, there will also be a um, uh, hearing, like a Zoom hearing that we can all participate in and share our um, opinions and thoughts. Uh, but that is unscheduled currently. So we need to um, ramp up pressure to get that scheduled. So we have an opportunity to um, talk live with these decision makers. Uh, and um, we need to pressure all of the council uh, on this issue um, to try and reduce uh, the MPD's funding instead of increasing it as they're proposing and more broadly to, the, to take the money that would be going to the police and investing it in schools and libraries and ending systemic racism uh, and in social services. So if you are interested in getting involved uh, in, in uh, defunding the MPD. Um, we have a uh, sign up form um, that you can uh, go to. So the link to that is tinyurl.com slash defund the MPD. That's tinyurl.com slash defund the MPD. Um, and I hope uh, everyone who is interested and in, in inspired, uh, inspired by uh, the program tonight and is ready to take on uh, racist police in our city. Um, we'll join this campaign and, and uh, take action. Thank you all.